Good day, grade 12s. Welcome to this next lesson in organic chemistry. I hope you've had an awesome weekend and that you had a good Monday and that you're ready and set to get going with this organic chemistry. So as you saw, uh, just a gentle reminder, this is what we did on Friday. Basically, we were going through this question and we were working through all the different types of exam paper questions and we've got this one and this one to work through before we start with electrochemistry as promised. So I'm not going to rush it. We're going to go through it and hopefully we'll get far enough that we'll be able to go through electrochemistry and that's the plan. So let's continue. OK, so what did we have? We had an alcohol over here. We had an aldehyde because it's double bonded O. We said that this was an alkane because it was actually we said it was a hydrocarbon. It was a C8H16, which is actually an alkene. Yeah, you've got a halo alkane with a branch. Propanoic acid is a carboxylic acid. This is an alkyne because it's C8H14. That's an alkane, and there you've got a ketone. Right, now it says we're writing down the IPAC names of different things. So now it wants the IPAC name of compound F. Okay, so there's compound F. So the only way we can really work out the, comp the IPAC name of compound F is if we draw it out. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to draw out. We've got one carbon, which has got three hydrogens on it. One, two, three. Then we've got a carbon. Then we've got, so I'm just going to tick them so we know where we're at. We've got another carbon on here. Okay, then we've got a carbon with a hydrogen and attached to it is a methyl group, carbon, carbon, that's that. Then we've got another carbon with two hydrogens and then we've got a carbon with three hydrogens on it. Okay, so let's just check. We've got a carbon with three hydrogens, one, two, three. We've got one carbon here, which is over there, then another carbon, and then over here we've got one, sorry, with one hydrogen. Yes, and then two, that's a methyl group, they've all got their little hydrogens. Ethyl group, shall I say, then a C with two H's and C. Okay, so we know this is an alkyne because of the fact that it's C8H14. So if we look at this, do you agree that are we sure it's an alkyne? Yes, it is, because of the fact that it's C8H14, and the formula for this alkyne is CnH2n minus 2, so that's it. So where could our triple bond be that would prevent these things from having hydrogens? And it would have to be over here. If the triple bond was over here, then this one would have hydrogens. So therefore it has to be over here because then this carbon's got one, two, three, four. This carbon's got one, two, three, four. Okay, so now that is our formula. Now they're asking us to write the IUPAC name. So the first thing we need to realize is that the main branch has got to have the functional group, group in it and that is the functional group, okay? So now we need to count. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it really doesn't matter which way we go. We can't go this way because that does not have the functional group in it, okay? So we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. And why am I counting from left to right instead of from right to left? Because if I count from left to right, my functional group is on carbon two. But if I count from right to left, my functional group is on carbon one, two, three, four. And we always want our functional group to be on the lowest carbon. We always want it to be on the lowest carbon. Okay, so let's now do that. Sorry, I'm just busy making sure that I can see everything that's going on here. Okay, so now we've got our main group. So let me just get my highlighter out. And we're going to highlight that. That there is our main our main, our main chain. So now let's look for our groups. Do you agree that that there is a branch? And that's it. There's no other branches, okay? So now it gets much easier to name because then it's very easy. Do you agree that this has got a hex because it's six? It's an ion because it's got a triple bond and it's a hex two ion because it's on carbon two. And this is an ethyl group because it's got two carbons. So we've got 
ethyl hex 2 iron and we need to tell them where this ethyl group is and it's on carbon 4. So it's 4 ethyl hex 2 iron or you could have written and I'm just going to write it, we're going to write it, I'll write it at the top here. You could have written 4 ethyl 2 hex iron. Okay, that makes it easier for you. Then you can write the 2 in front because you're saying that the triple bond of the iron is on the second carbon within the hex group, I mean the hex chain. Okay, so there we go. Now they want compound G. Okay, so let's look at compound G and change color. So compound G, we know is an alkane because of the C8H18. Alkane is a general formula, CNH2 and plus 2. So now we're going to again draw this out, okay? So we're saying that there are, on this one carbon, okay, we've got two methyl groups. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start this side. So we're going to go C with three hydrogens there, tick. Then we've got a C with two hydrogens, tick. Then we have a C, that C there, but it's got a methyl group on it. One, two, three, tick. And it's got a hydrogen. Then it's got CH2, C, dush, dush. Then we've got a C here. And then it's got a hydrogen on it, and then it's got two methyl groups. Which is a very way, weird way of putting it. Do you agree? What we're saying is on this carbon, there are two methyl groups. One, two, three. One, two, three. That's H. That's, so do you see that the, writ, the way it's been written is actually incorrect? Because it is saying that one of these is a methyl group, but in fact it can't because it's on the end of the main chain. That's a hydrogen. So we're going, let's just check. So we've got CH3, two of them. One, two. Then a carbon, one with one hydrogen. There we go. Then a carbon with two hydrogens. Yep. Then a carbon with one hydrogen and a methyl group. Yep, yep, yep. Then a carbon with two hydrogens and a carbon with three. Okay. So now, do you see that our functional group is an alkane? So it's a single bond. Okay, I do agree. And I'm just filling in the extra hydrogens. So now, what do we need? We need to decide on our main chain how long it is. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, it's not going to work. One, two, three, four, five, six, not going to work. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, well, six does work. So I'm going to go straight across again. I'm going to be very boring. And I'm going to go straight across. There it is. Main chain. Okay. So do you agree then my two branches are up here and up here? Okay. So this is actually wrong. The way they've written that is wrong. So now we can name it. Okay. Now, since all of the bonds are single bonds, we don't have to worry about which side we have to go closest to for the functional group. So then the next thing that wins when it comes to starting sides is which side is nearest a branch. So if we go, yeah, we've got one, two branch, where if we go this way, it's one, two, three branch. So we're definitely going to do left again. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. So do you agree this is definitely hexane? Definitely hexane, okay? And there's a methyl group here, because it's got one carbon and a methyl group there. And which carbon are they on? They're on carbon two and four. So it's going to be two, four, Diamethyl hexane. There you go. Nice. There. So that was G. Now it says, and I'm just going to erase not all of it. I'm just going to erase the bit that we've just written. Unfortunately, the other stuff, the screen stuff in here, um, is embedded on the PowerPoint now, so I can't get rid of that. Pity. Okay, so. Let us continue. 
Now it says write down the structural for formula of compound D. They want us to write it out as it would appear in the structural formula. So we've basically been doing the structural formula, but now they're asking us to help us name it. Okay, now they're asking us to do the structural formula. So first of all, you always check out your longest chain, which is a butane, and butane is four carbons, right? So you've got one, two, three, Four. And since it's an alkane, that means it's all single bonds, so life is cool. Then we just randomly, we can choose. We're going to go from left to right. One, two, three, and four. Okay? And then it's easy because we're going on the first carbon and the second carbon, there are bromos. Okay, so on the first carbon, there's a bromo. On the second carbon, there's a bromo. On the third carbon, there's a methyl group with a hydrogen, hydrogen, Hydrogen and guys, it really doesn't matter which side you put these bromines and methyl groups, whatever makes you happy. And don't forget your hydrogen. If you lose, forget your hydrogens, you lose all your marks. Okay, so that was pretty easy. Now it says we don't compound D. Now it wants compound H, which is four methyl penton to own. Okay, so again, pretty easy because all we need to do is work out from the back end. So remember, we've already said that pentane to own is a ketone and the functional group of a ketone is double bonded O. Okay, like an aldehyde, except that it's not on the end. So if we do this pentane to own, we've got one, two, three, four, five. And again, we can number them in the order that we've decided it should go. On the fifth carbon, no, sorry, on the second carbon, there's a double bonded O. And on the fourth carbon, there's a methyl group. There you go, just look at the black. Isn't that much easier? Isn't that easy? And I'm not filling in all these hydrogens because I don't have space, but you get the gist. Okay, so there's that. Okay, now it says compound A and compound E. Okay, right, so I can erase all the ink that I kept. So now I've got a bit more space. Now it says compound A and compound E are heated in the presence of a few drops of concentrated sulfuric acid. Write down the type of reaction that takes place. It's, it's serification. And they will actually accept a condensation reaction as well condensation because it makes water. Now it says write the structural formula of the organic product. Okay, so do you agree that this here has got two carbons? Okay, so therefore this is an ethanol and this is propanoic acid and it's got three carbons. So let's think about this. The alcohol is going to be C-C hydrogen hydrogen Hydrogen, they only want the product. They only want the product, right? What are we forming? We're forming an ester, and therefore there's an ester linkage, which goes O dash C double bonded O. That's your ester linkage, right? It joins an alcohol and an ethanoate, I mean, a carboxylic acid to become an ester, okay? And then propanoic acids with three carbons. So we've already used up one, so then it's two, three there we go hydrogen 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 and there you go so there is your ethanol which has become an ethyl and here's your propanoic acid has become propanoate hmm not too bad hey right so remember i said to you that these two questions were actually both on the same exam paper and the reason i liked it was because this question it was all to do with basic theory, like just learning what's an alkene or aldehyde, learning how to name things and everything else with a little bit of understanding with regards your compound A and compound E and the type of reactions. This one is more to do with explanations. It's to do with type of structural summarism and then to do with boiling points and intermolecular forces. So both of these questions are very good examples of the type of exam paper questions that you can expect. Okay, so let's work through it and I need a different color. 
Okay, it says compounds A through to E shown in the table you are used during two investigations to determine factors which influence the boiling point. Okay, the compounds are of similar molecular mass and therefore is considered as a control variable. So they're saying that they think that the relative molecular mass can be considered as a control variable. And if you look at this, except for your alcohol over here, all the others have got exactly the same molecular mass. So I think it's a very good control variable. Now it says, compounds A, B, and C are structural isomers. Okay, do you see 2-methylbutane, 2-2-dimethylpropane, and pentane? And they say they are structural isomers. Name the monologous series to which they belong. Well, this is a butane, that's a propane, and that's a pentane. So I'm really hoping you guys all know that this is an alkane. Okay. Now it says the type of structural isomerism shown by these compounds and it's positional. Okay, do you see that here yeah, we've got pentane which is a long five chain. Yeah, we've moved, we've got two to dimethyl and yeah, we've got two methyl. So all we do is branching it, okay? So we're changing the look of it. Now it says, consider the boiling points of the compounds in investigation one. So we're only looking at this. We're only looking at that. So and if we're looking at those three, okay, we've got the highest boiling point is pentane. And do you agree that pentane's got the longest chain? It's got five in it, again, the longest chain. The next highest is 2-methylbutane, which has got four in the main chain. And the lowest is 2-2-dimethylpropane, which has got three in the main chain. So you could either say that either the longer the chain, the higher the boiling point, the longer the straight chain. Or you could say the more branched the compounds are, the lower the boiling point. Now it says write down the independent variable. Now remember the independent variable is the one that you change. Okay? And the dependent variable is the one that we measure. So I would say that the independent variable is your main chain length. Or you could say it's the number of branches. Either of those two is going to give you the right answer in the marks, okay? Now it says, fully explain why the boiling point increases from compound A to compound C. Now, as I, when I was teaching you guys, and we spoke about the fact that when they talk about length of chains and surface areas, and it gets very confusing. So a better option is to talk about the main chain. You guys know that the longer the main chain, the longer the main chain, the greater the London forces, therefore the greater the, which is the intermolecular forces, therefore the greater the boiling, the energy required to separate the molecules or atoms, therefore the greater the boiling point. So we can say therefore that pentane's with the longest main chain at five, with five and it has a boiling point of 36. If I didn't know what these two were and I looked at those, I would definitely be able to say that this main chain is much longer than that one. Okay, now it says which one of the compounds B or C will have the higher Vapor pressure at a given temperature. Refer to the data in the table and give a reasonable answer. Well, the correct answer is that the higher vapor pressure will belong to B. Why? Because it's got a lower boiling point. It has got a lower boiling point. Okay, which means that it is easier to get it into a gas phase. Okay, it's easier to change into a gas phase, okay? And why? That's because it's got the weaker London forces, or you could say intermolecular forces, okay? Um, therefore, it's going to have the higher vapor pressure, okay? Because the easier it is to reach a boiling point, the higher the vapor pressure is. The quicker it is for the liquid to become a gas and then just to hover above the surface to become a vapor pressure. Now it says write down the type of intermolecular forces between, okay, between C and between D. 
Okay, between C is just going to be land and forces. And between D, D has got an hydroxyl in it, so therefore we can say that it is definitely going to be hydrogen, hydrogen bonding, bonding. Right, now it says, consider the investigation two. Okay, this one here, so let's change color so we can see what we're doing. Talking about investigation two. Okay, it says refer to the type of van der Waals forces in each of these compounds to give reason why, um, to give reason why these forces or the boiling point will actually, hang on, let me just read this again. Sorry, I just want to see something. Okay. Um, give me half a second. I just want to check something. I just want to check if my boss has responded to me if it's, Okay, good, no. Okay, so it says, consider investigation two, refer to the type of van der Waals forces in each of the compounds to give a reason why the boiling point of compound D is higher than that of compound E. Okay, and it's to do with this, yeah. Compound D, compound D has got an hydroxyl group, whereas compound E, compound E, has got the carboxyls and you got that double bonded O. So the thing is that the reason that the boiling point is higher for compound D is because this dude's going to have hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding and mainly hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is much stronger than the weak van der Waals forces. But remember what I said to you? I said to you that even though they mentioned van der Waals forces in the exam papers, you guys know that you should be talking about London forces. If you look in your exam guidelines and your CAPS documents, they now talk about London forces way more than they do talk about van der Waals forces, okay? So you need to know that we're talking about hydrogen bonding here and London forces. Okay, so those are some very nice organic chemistry questions. Um, I think the best thing for you guys to do, really the best thing to do, is to practice as much as possible, to learn your theory, and then go practice, 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 practice. Okay, so let's talk electrochemistry. Okay, so let's start off nice and slowly. First of all, just as an introduction, we use electrical, electrochemistry every single day of our lives. For example, we use it in batteries. And you can see from this, I know it's not an advert for Panasonic. I just like this picture because it's got a whole bunch of different types of batteries. You've got your rechargeable batteries. You've got those little disc batteries you use in your watch. You've got a big um, car battery over here. So um, there's really a lot of different styles of batteries depending on your uses. Okay, and every single one of these is very special because within it is an electrochemical reaction that's happening, okay? Even when it's not connected, there's a small electrochemical reaction that's happening. But let's just consider that at the moment it's a, an electrical chemical, electrochemical reaction occurs when we connect it. Now, we need to talk about redox because electrochemical cells and redox go hand in hand. And redox is made up of two words. There's reduction and oxidation. Reduction and oxidation, okay? So when we spoke about acid and bases before, and when I say before, I mean, okay, we, us, haven't done acids and bases, but you're already at the end of August. You're just about on your prelims for grade 12 science. So you guys should be really with it when it comes to your content, and you should have studied acid and bases before. Now, acid and bases is called protolysis. Acid and base reactions are called protolysis. And the reason they're called protolysis, and yes, I will do acids and bases after this, but acids and bases are called protolysis because of the transfer of hydrogen ion, but a hydrogen ion is a proton. And just a little aside, how do I get that? Well, a hydrogen atom is made up, well, 99% of hydrogen. In other words, ignoring deuterium, tritium, and all the other um, isotopes. 90% of hydrogen is 99% is made up of one proton, no nucleons, and one electron. One electron. Okay, one proton, one electron. Okay, now, if we remove that electron, it becomes a hydrogen ion. Iron is an atom that's gained or lost electrons. But what is it really? It's just a proton floating around. Okay, there's no 
It has a potential orbit around it, but there isn't one, okay? So therefore, there's no electron traveling around, okay? So in acid-base reactions, there's a transfer of the hydrogen ion, which is really proton transfer or protolysis. Redox, and that's what we're talking about now, is a transfer of electrons. And that's where the names like electrolysis comes from. So a common daily example is rust which you will see very often and everywhere. Okay, and we will go through an example where I talk to you more about rust later on. Okay, so we said about oxidation and reduction being two halves of the reaction, okay, making up the redox. Okay, but what you need to understand is because we said it's a transfer of electrons, that oxidation is said to be the loss of an electron. So if something has lost electrons, we say it is oxy dies, whereas if it gains electrons, we say it's reduced. Now, you guys might be thinking about the fact that if it's gaining electrons, why do we say reduced? Because reduced, as far as we're concerned, is making smaller. But what you need to think about reducing, reducing is that it's actually becoming more negative, okay? It's becoming more negative. And why is that? It's becoming more negative because electrons are negatively charged. So when these electrons move onto something else, it actually makes them more negative. Okay, so a nice little thing that helps us remember this is oil rig, where oil stands for oxidation is loss and rig reduction is gain. Reduction is gain. Okay, now... An example of this, a typical example of this, which people don't think of as a redox because they just see a flame, is magnesium burning in oxygen to form magnesium oxide. So what they do is they take this beautiful silver metal, and you can't really see, but this bit here, this is the silver metal there. Okay, it's usually a fine ribbon. And they burn it in oxygen. Okay, and when they do, it forms a dull gray ash, okay, which is your magnesium oxide. Okay, so what happens is you've got magnesium, which is in group two, so it's got two valence electrons. Okay, and oxygen's in group six, so it's got six valence electrons. So what happens is that both of these want to be neutral. Okay, they want to be the same as in a noble gas. So magnesium is going to lose two of its electrons, okay, and oxygen is going to gain those two electrons to have a full octet. So in the end, magnesium and oxygen together have two full electrodes together. They have two full electrodes to form magnesium oxide, okay? So another example of this is a copper zinc cell, okay? So this is what a galvanic cell looks like and you don't have to worry about that too much right now i just want to talk to you about copper and zinc and there's a little animation that i managed to get hold of i just need to get to it so you have to wait okay and unfortunately my thing doesn't allow me to write over it so we just have to talk about it and then okay so yeah you can see that initially we've got zinc which is full bar and the electrons are flowing off the zinc and going on to the copper, which is the cathode. So the anode is negatively charged with respect to the cathode in this case, and the cathode is positively charged. So what is happening is we're saying that the copper is attracting the electrons off the zinc. The copper is attracting the electrons off the zinc. Now, as it does that, this then becomes more negative, attracts the copper from the solution to form a lot of copper here. Whereas, yeah, this solution is becoming more and more negative. So therefore, it has to break up into zinc plus ions to become neutral. And I will go through this again properly. Okay, but all I wanted to show you was that there was actually this happening. The zinc is breaking up into zinc 2 plus plus two electrons. The copper is gaining those two electrons to form copper. Okay, the copper 2 plus ions, okay, are gaining the electrons to form copper. Okay, so then we need to talk about this, okay, because a lot of students struggle with it, and that's the terms oxidizing agent and reducing agent. Okay, so if I'm being reduced, okay, 
then what is happening? I'm gaining electrons, right? So if I'm being reduced, I'm gaining electrons, right? Um, so in other words, let's say that these electrons are coming here. We can see the copper is being reduced, right? Why? Because I'm gaining electrons. There's nothing I can do about it. You're gaining electrons, right? But if I'm gaining electrons, what am I doing to the other dude? I'm causing him to be oxidized. I'm causing him to be oxidized. So therefore, I'm the oxidizing agent. Similarly, if I'm being oxidized, if I'm losing electrons, then I am the reducing agent. Why? Because I need more work. I'm pushing out this work that is going to be, it says, why is, is why, why, if it is oxidized, it's to be the reducing agent, okay? Because what is happening here? It is be getting, it has been oxidized, right? So if it's oxidized, you are losing your electrons. If you're losing your electrons, you are causing the electrons to be transferred to this other electrode, which means that you are being, that you are being the reducing agent. You're causing the other thing to be reduced. You're causing the other thing to be reduced. Okay, so what we are saying is that redox work together. They work at the same time, simultaneously. And it's always a transfer of electrons. They go round and round and round and round. And when do they stop? Just for the record, with this type of thing, they stop either when this gets charred up or this gets too full, but that almost never gets too full, or this gets too empty. So it's usually when this gets charred up. But when we talk about galvanic cells, we'll talk more about that, okay? So this is actually revision of your grade 11. This is showing you how to write redox reactions as two half reactions. So you didn't really need to know about the galvanic cell in order to understand this, but it's nice always to be able to see what you're talking about. So we can write the redox reaction as two half reactions like we did here. We've got zinc that is giving away its electrons and we've got copper two plus ions that are taking those two electrons to form copper. See, look how the copper is getting fatter and fatter. That's because it is taking the two electrons, joining it with the copper two plus ion to form copper. Okay. So you can, re you can write the redox as two half reactions and these half reactions can be used to balance the redox reactions. Okay. So let's look at an example. They tell us that chlorine gas oxidized Fe2 plus ions to Fe3 plus. Okay, so the chlorine gas is the oxidizing agent. It oxidizes it from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. In the play process, chlorine is reduced to chloride ions. Write a balance equation for this reaction. Okay, so what do we know? We know that Fe2 plus goes to Fe3 plus. Okay, we're going from Fe2 plus to Fe. 3 plus, right? What do we notice? We know that this is actually more positive. So do you agree it's given away an electron? So we can say, okay, fine, it's given away electron. So therefore, we can say Fe3 plus plus an electron gives me Fe2 plus if you want to think of it that way. Okay, now what else? We also know that the chlorine is reduced to chloride. Now chlorine is Cl2. And it becomes chloride, which is Cl minus, but we need to balance it, okay? Do you agree that there's two chlorine atoms in your diatomic molecule of chlorine, okay? So if there's two of them, we're going to form two chlorides, okay, happy with that. But do you agree this is negative? So it must have got those electrons from somewhere, and it got it from the chlorine. So we can say Cl2 plus two electrons gives you two Cl minus. Okay, so now we've got this equation here and that equation there, and now we're going to balance them. So I'm just going to erase all the ink and then rewrite them. So we've got Fe2 plus goes to Fe3 plus plus three electrons. Similarly, you've got Cl2 plus two electrons goes to two Cl minus. Okay, so do you notice that when I wrote these out, I tried to make sure that my arrows were one on each other. And what's important is for you guys to realize that you have to show, especially with the half reactions, the direction of the electron flow, okay? So now we need to balance. So how many electrons are given off here? Three electrons are given off here. But how many of you are taken up is two. 
So do you agree I need to somehow balance this that this will work? And the only thing I can think of is to take it. This is just like maths, okay, with compound. I think it's the finances. You need to know how to do it, okay? So we're going to go, okay, right? Let's go through this. We need to add, we need to multiply this by 2. If we multiply this by 2, it's because simultaneous equations, okay, guys? If you multiply this by 2 and you multiply this with 3, what do we end up with? Well, if we do that, you can obviously multiply the whole thing, not just the one part. So it becomes 2Fe2+, plus. goes to 2Fe3+, plus. plus 2 times 3 is 6 electrons. This one becomes 3Cl2, plus 6 electrons, goes to 3 times 2 is 6Cl-, minus. And that's it. Okay. I don't know why I'm blurred. Okay, right. Now, we need to balance because this is what we're doing. We're balancing. So, do you agree that what's happening here is this dude here is giving away six electrons and the chlorine is taking the six electrons to become chloride ions, okay? The 2Fe2 plus is breaking up to form 2Fe3 plus plus six electrons. These six, six electrons are being accepted by the chlorine molecules to form chloride ions atoms, okay, ions, should I say. So now, if we write this out, and I'm going to do it very slowly, let's write everything on the left-hand side. So we've got 2 Fe2+, plus 3 Cl2, plus 6 electrons, goes to 2 Fe3+, plus, plus 6 Cl-, minus, plus 6 electrons. Okay, so do you see we've got six electrons on this side and six electrons on this side so they can cancel. And what are we left with? We're left with 2 Fe2+, plus 3 Cl2, goes to 2 Fe3+, plus, plus 6 Cl-. Minus. And just check it. Okay, yeah, you've got two ions. So you've got two ions. Admittedly, they're 3 plus and 2 plus. But that's fine. And you've got three times two, six chlorines and six chlorides. Done. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so now you can see how we can use redox and half reactions to balance an overall equation. So now let's talk more about electrochemical cells and more about what we are going to use in this year's worth of, because remember that was all revision of grade 11. This is what we're going to be concentrating with this year. Okay, well you should have concentrated this year. Firstly, electrochemical reaction involves a transfer of electrons. Please remember that it's very important as a transfer of electrons. Also, there is a conversion of chemical potential energy to electric potential energy or electrical potential energy to chemical potential energy. Okay. So if you think about this, chemical potential energy to electrical energy, potential energy is all your batteries. In other words, if I can put it in something electronic and it makes that electronic thing go, okay, even if it's, it doesn't matter what it is, if I'm putting something in that changes from, I'm making it happen, then I've got chemical potential energy to electrical potential energy. But if I have to put a battery in it to cause the chemicals to move, then I'm converting from electrical potential energy to chemical potential energy. And we're going to discuss these two because this is where they are. One is galvanic and the other is electron, elect, electrolytic. One of these provides us with electrical energy from the chemicals and the other one takes electrical potential energy and converts it into chemical potential energy. So let's talk about galvanic cells. That's our first one. So a galvanic cell is also re referred to as a voltaic cell after Mr. Voltaic, which is Mr. Volt, never mind, Voltaire, actually it's Voltaire, anyway, Voltaire, Voltaire, okay, there we go. He was the first person to come across, well, the first Western person. Admittedly, the Egyptians had years and years and years and years before been using batteries. Um, they used to take clay pots and put electrolytes in them and put lead, copper and zinc pipes in it, and they actually made batteries. Um, but he, this dude was the first person in the Western civilization at the period when science was cool um, to discover that you could actually make a cell using copper and zinc discs. Okay, so a galvanic cell consists of two half cells. Okay, two half cells. So remember what we said? We said that there were two half reactions. Well, if each of those half reactions is in one of the cells, then it makes sense, right? Now it says 
they also convert, well, the galvanic cells convert chemical potential energy into electrical potential energy. So these are our batteries. Our the galvanic cells are our batteries. And they have a spontaneous chemical reaction. That makes sense. You don't want to put a battery into, I don't know, um, your cell phone or your iPad or whatever, and then have to light it up or heat it up for to have a reaction and make electrical power, do you? No. What you want is to stick the battery in, put the wires across, and get a result. So it's important to realize that galvanic cells or voltaic cells don't have... They don't have a battery supply because they are the battery supplier. So if you ever, ever, ever are trying to recognize a cell, okay? In other words, if you've got something that looks like this, okay, and there's like this, okay? And then there's something that looks like this, Exactly the same, okay, porous membrane. We'll talk about labels in a second. This is a way of getting, finding out whether you've got a galvanic or electrolytic cell. It's another trick, okay? This here is a galvanic cell. Why? Because it's measuring the electrical potential energy that is given off by the galvanic cell. This is taking stored electrical potential energy and making something happen. So this is not, it is actually electrolytic cell. This year, where we take the two pieces of metal, stuff it into some electrolytes, and put a light bulb or voltmeter across, and that hap the reaction happens spontaneously, then we have a galvanic cell. Okay, so I've got a lot that I want to explain about this galvanic cell and then move on from there. So I'm actually going to stop in our grade 12s and we will start again in uh, tomorrow talking more about the galvanic cell and all everything you need to know, like the salt bridge and everything else, the anode cathode, red cat, oxa, the whole thing. So we'll do that tomorrow. Have a wonderful evening.